E41 Marketplace Ministries. It's all about your business and it's all about our father's business. It's ministry outside the box. No matter what your role is in the business world, E41 Ministries is a special place where we can walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called, just as Ephesians 4.1 commands us. In today's busy and frenetic world, it's a blessing to know that God has a plan to bring hope, comfort, and peace through Marketplace Ministry. The E41 Marketplace Ministry of the Fellowship, it's a kingdom-building business. Praise God. Well, Father, we love you and thank you for your love. Thank you for this time together. We believe, Lord, that we are led by the Spirit of God, and we desire, Lord, to have your anointing upon everything that we do. So we invite the presence of the Holy Spirit, and we say, have your way, Holy Spirit. Do what you want to do in this time together. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm really excited about the Marketplace Ministry because I was in the marketplace ministry before it was called marketplace ministry. I spent uh, about uh, almost 20 years in the marketplace as a CPA, went full-time in ministry in 1977, but this uh, this is my testimony, and I don't know if other people can witness to this, but if you're really a sold out Christian in the marketplace, you can have a greater impact on the kingdom of God than you can if you're standing in the pulpit because you come in contact with more sinners than you do when you're a preacher. You get kind of isolated when you're a preacher and you're ministering and talking to uh, Christians most of the time, trying to motivate them to go into the marketplace. To me, the great job of the church is to equip the saints to go where they live and work so that they can do what needs to be done to bring the lost people into the kingdom of God. I know that I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1969, and I got saved in 1963, and really, uh, I was fanatical my whole Christian life because I didn't grow up as a Christian, but when I got saved, and if you heard my little testimony last night the day after I got saved was healed and then I began to see God just do miraculous things even before I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit so I, I just became uh, I thought everybody in the world needs this you know this is not something we need to hold to our chest this is something everybody needs and I remember the last uh, one of the firms that I was merging with as a CPA, uh, I'd been there about a month and actually I had two Jewish partners and one partner that was not a Christian and they had uh, invited me to be, to merge my accounting firm with theirs. And after about two or three months, I was talking to the, the head partner who was a Jewish guy and he said, uh, I never did tell you this, but he said, before we brought you in, we ran a check on you. I said, you did? And I said, well, how did the check go? And he said, well, he said, everything about it was just excellent, but they had one thing that we were a little concerned about. And I said, what was that? And uh, he said, well, the report came back that you were fanatical in your religion. (laughs) So so, uh, as a fanatical religious person, I saw more people saved as a CPA than I've seen saved as a pastor because you just reach so many people in the marketplace. So if we can understand that concept, what an impact the full gospel fellowship could have on the whole world because we could motivate so many people that are out there where lost people are that will come in contact with them on a daily basis, bring them into the kingdom of God. So we need to get behind what, uh, this vision is is to uh, get people that are out there where the lost people are and let them go to work. Free them up. Praise God. You know, you don't need a lot of education to be a marketplace minister. You just need to be excited. And, you know, just what you've got's good. And you want somebody else to have it. And you begin to talk to people. 
And, you know, in the Bible, one of the things that Paul did is everywhere he went, he gave his testimony. You know, he'd just share, man, I was on a Damascus road and got knocked off my horse and God said, and all of us have a testimony of something God's done for us. And you can, you can reach a lot of lost people just by, uh, well, this is what God did for me. And nobody can argue with a testimony. You know, you can talk about theology and try to convince people based on theology, but many times they need to know God's real. And it's our testimony that sometimes we can just share with people in a way that gets their attention and then we can begin to pray for people. And the good news is when you're following God, uh, God honors that because miracles happen in the marketplace. Praise God. Amen. Let's have a, a, a round of applause for Gene and a great word. I'm going to ask, uh, is, um, is Michael, oh, Michael, you are here. You know, it's an interesting discussion because some of the times the question comes up, there's a church, there's a business, and how do these all work together? And that's one of the questions. So I'm going to ask Michael, who is actually part of the education committee uh, here at uh, the fellowship, but whose role is placement director with Christ for the Nations. And one of the things that we were talking about is how even in in the role of equipping people to go out and, and take the gospel to the world, the importance of what happens on the marketplace level is something that's not lost. In fact, they're beginning now to work with certain programs that actually take this a whole step farther. So we were really excited to see that... Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like confirmation. Everybody's moving in the same direction. So without further ado, let me ask Michael to come up and speak and welcome Michael. Amen. Thank you, Carrie. I am just excited to be here. First of all, I just want to say what a blessing it has been to my wife and I to be part of the fellowship for the last five years. Uh, you know, it's one thing we, we talk about having connections and sharing resource, but to me, we have looked at it like relationships that we have formed and you know, hold very dear. Uh, and, and we feel, we feel very welcome. We feel very part and that's not always ex the experience that you get. So I want to say thank you, President Evans, especially for making us feel so at home here. And we look forward to this every year. Uh, I'm definitely honored to be here. I apologize. I'm going to be brief because I have to be at another uh, committee meeting. We talked about the education and they're actually deciding on scholarships as we speak. But uh, I am here representing Christ for the Nations, and I'm very excited about the new direction we're, we're having. I was a student at Christ for the Nations in 2004. I was part of a major called Leadership and Pastoral. Uh, one of the things I experienced on a regular basis is that we would have module speakers come in from all over the world, and they would have a show of hands, and they said, how many are called to be senior pastors, associate pastors? And they would go on, and it was amazing how few hands we saw. And so they would say, well, what are the rest of you doing here? Because the assumption was they were called to church staff ministry. But in that room, every semester, there was at least 60% of that crowd that were called to marketplace ministry and had no clear direction of how to go about doing it. And the, over the last year, we have started a marketplace major to really go about being intentional about training people who are intentionally called to marketplace ministry. I was in marketplace ministry for 15 years, like like uh, President Evans was saying before we really even knew what that term was. And the effectiveness in that area was much greater, actually, because I have pastored as well. And to, to have impact on people's lives. I think ministry is about relationship. Ministry is about people. I worked in sales, and one thing I learned was people buy from people. I had people tell me that they did business with our company simply because they trusted me. They didn't care if I had the best price. And so that wasn't my goal. My goal was to earn their trust and to support them after the sale so that we had an ongoing relationship. And then we got into wonderful conversations about, about my faith and what I believed. And we were able to have good conversation from that point on. But I want to tell you a little bit about what Christ for the Nations, the initiative that we're offering right now. Like I say, in the last year and a half, we've started what we call a marketplace major. There's two semesters of that. And the goal is to be intentional about reaching people who feel called to ministry, to leadership, but not in a church role, not in a staff role, but in the marketplace in every era of society. One of the things about Christ for the Nations we've seen since the time I've been there is the diversity that we have. For instance, one of our students right now is the chair senator 
in Bermuda. Now, she's been at Christ for the Nations for two years. She's going to be at her third year, and she flies back and forth. But she feels called to be influential in that arena of government, and she's getting trained at Christ for the Nations to do that. We have uh, several lawyers. We have a judge. Uh, it's just amazing uh, the different types of people and different callings we've had at Christ for the Nations. I will tell you this. My role as placement director, uh, I think it's the most exciting time I've ever been in because of what God is doing in the marketplace arena. One of the things that we're looking to do is, is uh, launch more practicum programs. And so, for instance, uh, our students now in the marketplace major are going to have semester internships available as well as summer internships available in many of the different uh, segments of the marketplace. We have relationships with our alumni, which is about thirty to 40,000 throughout the world in every arena imaginable. Uh, I don't know if anybody's here heard of the Jonas Brothers. Some of you are maybe a little older. Uh, when I came and they told me about them, I said I not really heard of them, but it wasn't long before I realized how big of a thing they were. And so I realized that uh, very, very influential, but their father, Kevin Jonas, is an alumnus of Christ for the Nations. And so they actually grew up on the campus. And so it was amazing just the relationship that we have with many of the alumnus that we can actually help train marketplace ministers in areas of communication, media, uh, government. Uh, we actually have an alumnus in Zambia right now that's running for president. And so the opportunities are limitless for us to partner with uh, people in the different societies, the segments of society to help train and to me to also affirm their calling as a minister, not just a, a pastor or a different leader in the church, but a minister in the marketplace. So that's really what I wanted to share a little bit about. I'm sorry for, for being brief, but uh, I will be available for questions at the table out there for Christ for the Nations. Uh, we do have courses uh, that are online as well, as well as weekend and evening. And I'd love to, to talk with you about that. God bless and thank you for this time. And thank you, Michael, for joining us for this. Uh, it really is uh, is uh, is a very exciting time because there is so much that's moving in this direction. And uh, Dave afforded me a few moments to talk a little bit about. It. He said, "Why don't you uh, give a little bit of your background and where how this all came to be?" And I want to share a story. Things in the island, but there's not really an economy or anything that they can really support themselves. So one of Alan's problems was always trying to figure out how to get. Uh, enough support to do the programs, to run the programs that they were doing on the island. And so talking with Dave, I said, what can, what is possible or how do you do this? Because I'm talking to one missionary and you're talking to them all over the world. And this can't be the only person who's ever said this to you. And he said, Gary, he said, my background, and he talked about his background of being a successful business person and how he's applied those principles to bring Christianity all around the world. So the idea we started talking about, so really what you're talking about in the missionary world is that you're trying to help them find a marketplace ministry that will help spread the gospel at the same time, creating the support that these, that that's really needed in the mission field to build this thing further. And as we kept having that discussion, we just kept, we just, we, it was very interesting how it came. And as we met people throughout the fellowship, people would ask myself and my wife, they would say, well, where is your church? What do you do? Who do you pastor? And at the time, we didn't know how to answer that question because we didn't have a church that we, we weren't sure. We knew we wanted to do things that serve Christ, but we didn't know. We didn't necessarily say, well, wow, we should have a church. It, it, it wasn't what, what we were really all about. So one of the things that happened in this is we started to realize, well, one of our roles is to do what we can in the marketplace to help spread the word and help get people into churches. And I think we can't be the only Christians who are in the marketplace, who are in business, who want to help spread the gospel. And there's a whole need for a set of, of, of resources and help and tools that help us to do that. And I'm going to talk about that just a little bit farther, but I want to add another thing. We happened, our home church, it's a long story, but our home church is the Potter's House of Dallas, Texas. And 10 some odd years ago, our pastor there, Bishop T.D. Jakes, felt the need to move out into uh, mo movies, to do, to do uh, Christian movies. And one of the things that he told us at a partner's meeting, he said, the reason I feel like this, he said, where do we get the pastors? He said, we have to get them out of the pews. 
He said, where do we get people into the pews? We have to get them out of the streets. So how do we get them? We have to go out in the streets and meet them where they're at. And that was one of his arguments for starting Christian movies. And as you know, the amazing story was Hollywood said that can't be done. I love to tell the story. Our company, we work on a number of different Christian movies. Everybody's familiar with the success of God's Not Dead. And the perfect proof of this is if you go home and you look on RottenTomatoes.com, which is a movie rating site, you will find out that the critics totally panned God's Not Dead. I think it got 12% positive critique. So the world said, this is hokey. This is just Christian people with their delusions. Don't waste your time on it. But if you check the Rotten Tomato score, the people who actually went to the movie all gave it like 90% positive reviews. And it shows the drastic difference that exists in, quote, the marketplace and in the church. But the beautiful thing about it is Christians do vote with dollars. And so now movies like... God's Not Dead, which came out on a budget that Hollywood laughs at, has done $35, $45 million before it hits the DVD marketplace. And a movie like Heaven, Heaven is for Real has now done $100 million. And it's effective at getting out to people who might not yet accept the message, I need to go to church. So that's one of the reasons why I think we have an opportunity in the marketplace. When Dave and I sat down, he called me, he said, I I think there's an opportunity for us to really try to, to coalesce this into a program. What could we do that would help people really understand that there is a bridge that we can build between the churches and the marketplace so that if we're in the church and we're, we're ministering on Sunday, How do we motivate the people who are going to go out into the marketplace Monday through Friday and fight all those battles with people who could be hateful, mean, whatever, Uh, you know, uh, we joke about it, but it's not a joke. You know, saying Jesus in the worst in the workplace is a is is probably less acceptable than saying some of the four letter words. You know, it really I, I don't get it, but people out there get that offended by it. How do we help create those resources that help make the church effective at moving outside the four walls. And thank God that the Supreme Court gave us some backup in thinking about the Hobby Lobby case. We taped some shows. Dave and I sat down in February. We taped shows in, 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 um, we taped shows in uh, Florida. And the objective for those was that number one, I wanted to set up a series with Dave where Dave could explain about his extensive background of having worked with this over the, over the years, all over the world. He, you know, he travels two, 250 plus 300 days a year ministering and he's always confronted with the same issue about marketplace ministry. So for us, What we wanted to do was establish, first of all, some instructional information that becomes the the very, we're at the beginning tip of the iceberg of where I believe God is going to allow us to move with all of this because there's such a need for this in the marketplace right now. So we created some videos and some things that are kind of like the first examples of where this is all going to go on the... uh, there, if you've got one of the little yellow postcards on the back, you'll see there's a website. It's E41, Ephesians 41. So it's walk worthy according to the vocation to which you're called. And, and that's where it comes from, E41ministries.com. And you'll see the beginnings of where the website's headed. You'll see there's some videos there. You'll see there's some information there. There's going to be a lot more coming. There's also a Facebook site, which we're going to be promoting. And what we really want to do is promote a dialogue. So you'll see when you start to look at some of the TV programs that have already been put together, as well as the television programs that we're going to be recording while we're here, including this one that we're we're part of right now, is that we're wanting to create this dialogue. So we have already interviewed people who come from really a church background who want to talk about how they're trying to be effective at motivating the people in their in their organization who come to church on Sunday, how they can be effective at bringing more people closer to the Lord. And then at, at the other side of the equation, which is the people who are in full-time business but who are operating Christian businesses, how do they work through all of the things that they have to work through in this hostile environment? 
environment of the marketplace. And Dave, when we first sat down, he said, really, Kerry, most people spend their time in one of three places. It's either going to be they're in the workplace, they're in government, or they are in education. And if we can make people in those three areas be very effective, that's going to be the key to really promoting the gospel the way we want to see it. So when you see some of these programs that have been taped, you'll see that's where the discussion is. We talk about how do you work it. We've talked to people who are who are basically running churches on Sunday, but but tent making during the week, how they work those two things together. We talk to people in larger churches where they are basically the full-time ministry aspect, but they're still responsible for all the marketplace programs and things like that. We talk to people like Carrie and Tammy who are in the marketplace as Christian business owners and trying to figure out how we best maneuver and how we best serve the Lord in that kind of a capacity. And it's amazing just to talk about the kind of people who lead the fellowship. Like uh, President Evans is talking about having as a career expert with numbers, knowing CPA, all the, like you said last night, all about generally accepted accounting principles, but God's accounting principles trump all of that. And so there's all those scriptures in the Bible that talk about, you know, the wealth of the unjust and all these different things that we can point to, and they all come back to marketplace ministry. So this is an organization that we really seek your help, your input, and the things that we can work on that will be resources that are going to be most effective and helpful to you. So really with that as kind of the backdrop, I'm going to, I'm going to put the microphone down and I'm going to ask Dave to call, come up and speak a little bit about the things that um, uh, he's had uh, decades of experience, both as a very successful uh, business owner with, with work, what he's done in the RV industry and things like that, but then also being a minister for 40 plus years and then counseling and coaching leaders all around the world for all these years. So I think uh, he's got some very, very important things to add to this whole conversation. So thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Kerry, and uh, appreciate so much you being here today. And I'm going to share just a little bit, and then we're going to have some uh, time for question uh, and answers. But uh, during the time that I spent giving leadership to our RV dealership was when God really began to put this in my heart about the power that is untapped in the church to change nations. When I wrote the book, Idol in the Marketplace, which you have in front of you, and you're free to take that one, and if you want to take uh, some others with you today, when you go, feel free to do that and give them to key people that you think uh, are open to the message. I want to encourage you to do that. But when I sat down after we left the RV dealership in my study, and I said, Lord, what do you want me to do now? Do you want me to go back and take a church? Do you want me to stay in the marketplace? It ended up being a six-hour conversation that day. I asked the Lord uh, as I was reading through the Gospels, and uh, often I try to read through all four at the same time. It's like four guys showed up at a fire, and they all have a little different perspective on what they saw. And I was taken that morning with Mark's passion for evangelism, and then I got to Matthew, who is was so strong on discipleship he went to all the world and make disciples of all nations and when i read all nations it leaped off the page i said god the church that i grew up in struggled making disciples one at a time we pretty good at making converts and getting people saved and even in the full gospel circle getting them filled with the holy spirit but um, I watched so many people over the years struggle just living a, a victorious Christian life. He said, I want you to go back and read Numbers and Deuteronomy, but read it this time from a discipleship perspective. He said, I brought Israel out of Egypt, as President Evan says last night, with the silver and gold. He said, money is not a problem for the church. Money is an answer, and so money can't be an answer and a problem at the same time. He said, the church has a struggle, and uh, the struggle is they don't know how to really make marketplace disciples. He said, if you're going to change a nation, as Kerry's already mentioned, you're going to have to send strong marketplace warriors into the business world, 
into government and really starting in education. The educational institutions determine the values and philosophies that the business people and the government people operate in every day. The challenge we face in our nation, and I see it now as I travel around the world, the kingdom of darkness has made tremendous advances against the kingdom of light because they have basically taken over business, government, and education. And so out of that six-hour conversation that day came the book Idol in the Marketplace, which is basically a challenge to doing church the way we've done it for 1,700 years. Maybe we need to take a different look at it and how we can make changes in those three entities. I also have it in audio form. Uh, if you'd like to get that one, that one's available. These are all going to be on the website here, uh, I would say, within the next 30 days to six weeks. Um, part of what we want to do is provide resources for you uh, on that website. And uh, so my material will be there, which is really dedicated uh, primarily to leadership and especially in the marketplace. One of the things that we want to make available as well is we want to help you develop an E41 ministry in your church if you're pastoring or in your marketplace effort. This is a sample of what Dr. Mark Barkley did in Midland, Michigan. I sat with him. Uh, really, this came about over a three-year period. And everywhere we go now, the it seems to be the interest is growing in what do we do about extending the ministry of the church in the marketplace. So we want to really help the fellowship members bring leverage to wherever God has them and whatever they're doing. We've tried for 2,000 years to get people to come to church. Jesus, for 2,000 years, trying to get the church to go to the people and uh, meet them at the level of their need where they are. If people won't come to church, let's the church go to them. And uh, we're, we're going to do that. I Again, I thank the leadership of the fellowship for uh, wanting to do this, to provide the opportunity to link up with um, both groups of ministers, uh, both those who are Ephesians 4.1 ministers and those who are called to a uh, equip them for the work of the ministry, what I call Ephesians 4, 11 to 16 ministers. Before we take questions, uh, uh, Christer Tepper's here, and uh, I don't know, Christer, did I alert you to do this? But I know you're uh, you're good at this. I've, it's been my privilege to work with Christer the last few years uh, as his personal coach, and uh, he's involved now in a very exciting project that's really going to be focused on the marketplace. And Christopher, why don't you come and just share a little bit about what's going on, and uh, then we'll take some questions and uh, see if we can help you. It's really been my heart for a while. Uh, I've been involved in ministry, music ministry, um, evangelistic kind of ministry for the better part of Oh, over 20 years, actually. And the question really, um, I've been wrestling with the question, how do you reach more people more effectively? You know, and in beginning days, you used to see a lot of people coming to churches for special events or different uh, concerts, as it would be, or whatnot. And, um, you know, the world's changing a lot. It's changing very quickly. And one thing that is very, uh, very noticeable is a very hard shell. People are uh, developing a very uh, thick skin uh, and really resisting anything to do with the Lord, the gospel, church in general, just as a banner. And uh, the question really is, how do we reach people? And how do we reach them effectively? We don't need to bring them into church right away. But we, I think it's the reason I really uh, stand behind what David's talking about here is that it's absolutely right. We need to get out where people are. And that's what Christ did. Uh, he met the woman at the well, not in the temple. He met her at the well. Uh, he met people on the road. He met people where they were. And the marketplace is where people are at and where people are bringing their needs and bringing their stuff, whether they're doing that intentionally or not. So uh, part of when, uh, what's on my heart is to reach people through media and through uh, music. Obviously, that's been 
uh, the areas that I've been most active in uh, ever since I was a kid. And uh, what we're trying to do, what uh, we, I say, the, the company that uh, I'm a part of, what we're doing is uh, producing songs and musical selections that tell the gospel story, uh, not just through music, not just through film, but through a combination of both. This really illustrate the gospel, both allegorically and directly, and because story is really, um, music tells a story. And that's one thing that we found across the, across the globe, really, is that people, it's a universal language. It's something that people understand. I travel to Asia a lot, to, to Europe and all across North America. And uh, it's something that really unifies people without having to speak a word. You can uh, speak into people's hearts. Yet, you know, the gospel is really something that every person needs. And when you can package it in a way that kind of gets beyond uh, theological differences or hang-ups that people may have had through church, uh, many people have been hurt in the past and are resistant. We run into that all the time. But uh, when you can play music and share something, it, it's something that happens on a different level that kind of gets beneath that hard skin and that shell that people are developing and culture is developing. So that's, in a nutshell, that is a project that we're involved in and uh, you know, finding creative ways of just meeting people at their point of need. And of course, thereby helping the church expand and grow and accomplish the mission that we've all been given. That is, uh, one day we are, gonna, we are all going to stand in front of God and uh, it's my prayer, always has been, and it's my aim to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And that's my prayer and my hope for you as well. Uh, and that we know that God is faithful and he will equip us with everything we need to take forth that message and to take back ground that's also been lost. Because people are very hopeless. That's what we see in the marketplace. I don't know, it's probably in churches too. I, you, can, you don't have to look far within the a church to see how many people struggle with uh, depression and with anxiety and uh, just fear of the unknown and whatnot. And they're looking for hope. And as believers, uh, we have it. At least I think we do. Or we're supposed to. And we're supposed to share it. So it's a joy and a privilege to do that. And just to do that more effectively and to uh, offer Christ and Christ for the nations, in every nation, to every person. Thank you, Chris, sir. You never know the impact that you're going to have. I, I believe that Paul's greatest two years of ministry was the two years in Ephesus where he lectured from 11 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon, what they call siesta hour. And Ephesus was the economic center of the world. And so as the marketplace people came to Ephesus to do business, they heard Paul. And churches all over Central Asia were started not by uh, the traditional church leaders, not by the 12 apostles out of Jerusalem, but by marketplace people who came, heard Paul in a neutral setting and went back and took the gospel with them and started churches. So the marketplace is made up of those three entities. Keep those in mind. People are in business or they're serving in government, or they are in education. And uh, really, the book came out of, of Genesis 24, verse 60, when the Isaac servant was there to get a wife for Isaac. And he found Rebecca, and her family was saying goodbye. And in verse 60, they said, may your children be tens of thousands of thousands, and may you do what with the gates? May you possess the gates of your enemy. The gates in the Old Testament, as you know, were places of influence, decision. Um, you know, that's where if you were an authority, you sat in the gates. Even the Proverbs 31 woman says, your husband shall be spoken well of in the gates, the places of authority. And you couple that with Matthew where Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates, the places of influence of hell will not prevail against the church. And so uh, we've got to go possess 
the places of influence, the three gates that control every nation, and that's the business, government, and education. So that's really what we want to do as a fellowship is to help the church leaders equip their people that go to those three gates every day and uh, take the full gospel message with them when they go. I I think the venue that you use to do it is going to be determined by that local church leader, but I'm working on a book now where I'm going to draw the parallel between the Ephesians fivefold gift ministry and Aaron and his sons, who were the forerunners, I believe, of the fivefold gift ministry. God gave gifts to men in Ephesians 4. It doesn't say he gave gifts to church men. He gave gifts to men. And when he gave you life, he gave you a gift. And so I see all five gifts in Ephesians operating in the marketplace and people who don't even know they have that gift. Unbelievers have a gift. And so in the marketplace, they call them entrepreneurs. We would call them apostolic, apostles. They work in the CEO's office. They start businesses. They're, they're the leader. And then you have the teacher and the prophet that work in the HR department. Teachers teach you what you need to know to do your job. And then you have the prophets who keep us in compliance. And the rule book in business is getting thicker and thicker every year. And then you have the evangelist who works in the sales and marketing department. They create a sense of urgency for whatever it is you're selling or making. And then... uh, Businesses have pastors, and those are the people that as you come out of the CEO's office and you just got really ripped up from one side to the other and you don't feel like you want to show up there again, somebody who has a pastoral gift will put their arm around you and say, oh, don't worry about it. His 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 bark's a lot worse than his bite. This is a great company to work for. You'll, you're going to make it. We're just so glad you're here. See, all five gifts. And so, George, to address your question, you know, again, we've got to educate our church leaders to understand the giftings of their own people, not just to work in the serving the church family. I believe people ought to come to church. They ought to assemble together. And forsake not as the manner of some is. But for what purpose? The purpose is we do all of this here on Sundays and maybe midweek so that you can be more effective out there where you live six days a week. But the reason that some want people to come is because the pastoral teaching gifts energized by people coming to listen to them. And so they get disappointed when people don't come. But if you have a leader who has an apostolic gift, then he's going to always be launching you out there into your gifting. So we have, you know, we have a challenge inside the church as well as reaching the marketplace as well. But uh, I think the particular venue, George, how a local person, that's the genius. This. I, I built the foundation for the E41 ministry, but Dr. Barclay put into this, as I encourage every pastor or leader to do, you determine what you want your marketplace leaders uh, to know and what training you want them to have. And then you customize this and make it fit for you. He, um, he had 46 people that signed up for the first go around and uh, he has a sliding scale. It's not free. Uh, if you make $50,000 or less, you pay $150 to go through the course up to $500 for people that make 250,000 or more. Uh, and so that's how he did it. It's not how you have to do it, but it's how he did it. And then he's got a card made up, a certificate, a lapel pin. Uh, you know, he's done it right. And when they finish, he calls them out in front of the church, lays hands on them, and commissions them as marketplace ministers. And I've talked with Brother Evans, and uh, at some point in the future, that's what we're going to start to do here as well in the fellowship. Just like we recognized those last night to have a calling to the church ministry, we're going to start recognizing those who have a call to the marketplace. This can be, for the fellowship, one of the most 
uh, impactful ministries of any organization, when we start getting the word out to marketplace ministers, there's a group of church leaders that are just waiting to link arms with you and help you be strong in the calling that you have. I was sat in the office of the president of a strong Christian university here just about a month ago, who's affiliated with a large Pentecostal denomination. I said, what would happen if you invited all the marketplace ministers in this denomination to show up at your annual conference? Instead of 15 or 20,000 clergymen, you'd have to rent Ohio State or the Coliseum in Las Vegas or in Los Angeles. I said, your crowd would go from 20,000 to 100,000 in one swift. I said, who do you think would be the first ones to resist that? And she smiled and she said, I know, but that's in my heart is to help build this bridge. She read my book, wanted to talk to me about the concept because she now, instead of just training university people to go out to their secular job, she's training future ministers in the marketplace, wherever God may call them. Those that aren't strong in reading English, the book is being translated now into Spanish. Uh, it's being translated into Polish. Um, talk to Eldon Tracy. He's going to translate it into du or, uh, Portuguese. And uh, so, um, yeah. But um, you have to understand and embrace the concept. And that's the challenge for the traditional church leaders to get their minds around it. We're, we're, not, we're not trying to marginalize your ministry. We're trying to increase the leverage of your ministry is what we're trying to do. But you do have to let people come to the table. I've talked to many, many marketplace people, and they said, we, we don't want to run the church. We just simply want to feel like we're part of the team other than a resident ATM machine. For, so whenever the pastor, the only time he talks to me is when he needs an offering or he needs a, a project completed, and then, then he knows my phone number. But uh, the rest of the time, he kind of forgets about me. And uh, so we kind of got to get the pyramid turned over so that uh, church leaders understand what their real calling is. So once you get that done, we'll be able to provide the resources for you. I encourage church leaders, give your people a little yellow sticky note. Because here's where evangelism starts. Too many people are afraid that their image of evangelism is getting a fistful of tracks and following the SWAT team evangelist to the mall on Friday night on what I call the Holy Ghost mugging mission. And that scares people who don't have that gift. That's not their gift. And so we have to teach people how to do Brother Evans, just what you did. And so I say on this little yellow sticky note, put one prayer, one sentence. Lord, help me be sensitive to those you're going to put in my life today and pray that every day and then let the Holy Spirit guide you. And I guarantee he will. You have to train that recreated spirit to be sensitive to the opportunities God's going to bring you away. Come on, Gail, and, and share. Um, when Dave said that about being in the marketplace, I worked in a bank. And, well, two things I just want to share. I think one thing we have to get over the fear of, in America, the devil has tricked us thinking, you can't talk about Jesus in the workplace. And that is not true. And we can, and we have to be bold about it. But in my desk, people would come in, and I'm a widow as of over seven years, and it seemed like when I went back to work after my husband passed, every other person was coming in with a death certificate, and you have to take care of their business. But you also have to take that time and know that what they need more than things being changed 
they need words of comfort and they need words of guidance and that's an opportunity it, it and you just take that and you only have to say one sentence and then you're going to know if they're open for that and they'll just spill it all out and then you can pray with them you can talk with them you can say anytime you want to call call me or whatever but all you do have is just be sensitive and God, wherever you're at in whatever business, um, my son sells cars. He has a small car, a car lot. People have come and before they leave, they'll have prayer because you find out their life story. When they're doing business with you, that's the time you have something they came that they needed, but you have more than they thought they needed. So you take that moment and share it and you'd be amazed at how much God will use you. Thanks, Gail. How do we reach uh, the resistant pastors? I, I think we'll just let them float a while, but uh, the ones that hesitate a little bit, they, you know, they, they want to listen, but they, uh, they're not really sure if they, it's like a bunch of guys sitting on a swimming pool, who's going to be in first, you know, type thing. How do, how do we, uh, how can we best do that? Gary, you've pastored for a long time, um, and I know you're open to this um, and are working at it there in Fort Worth. You want to come and just sh share your thoughts, Gary? It's dangerous giving a preacher a microphone, but I trust Gary. One of the uh, core truths, foundational truths of my ministry is that the kingdom of God is a kingdom of right relationships. And the relational dimension is what we're missing in the church today. We're so religious that uh, we don't understand that everything Jesus did, he did it in the context of relationships. And he gave us, he really gave us a pattern for implementation of ministry. And he just, he just, uh, one of his disciples asked him one time a question and he said, come and see. And I think, uh, I think the process is that we, we, we get one pastor who's hungry and we share in a relational context, whether that's coffee at Starbucks or whatever. And then that process begins and he takes that information or revelation, hopefully revelation, that excites him. And he has relationships with people that you'll never know. And so you multi it multiplies. That's the biggest hurdle. Our brother mentioned it. The biggest hurdle will be the leadership. And the reason for that is we are so legalistic oriented. We don't really understand that we are, but we are. We, we have bought into the era to the, the false teaching that, that our worth is based on what we do. And that's contrary to the gospel. Our value is is who we are in Christ. We are, we are valuable in Christ. And so when God began changing my life and, uh, and it's a long story and I won't share it, but after being effective in ministry from the world standard of effectiveness, I suddenly realized I, I'd been ordained 10 years. I suddenly realized that I didn't even know God. And it devastated me. It really devastated me. I knew about God, but I really didn't know him. And once I realized that I didn't know him, it created a hunger in my heart to know him. And out of that, that transformation, that transition, I began to pursue certain things. And one of them was that the church is really the body of Christ. And, and if it's really the body of Christ, guess what? I'm not the head of it. I'm a member just like 
the other members. I have a function. I have a place. I have an assignment. There's government in the body, but there's only one head, and that's Christ. And so I began to share from that relational dynamics and just share it with my friends, my acquaintances, my colleagues. And, and that's the way it, I think, has to begin. It, it has to begin one-on-one, -on -one, and then it begins to spread. Well, let's just stand and we'll have prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to share together today. These have been wonderful testimonies. I thank you, Lord, that we do have a great fellowship that has a heart to reach people around the world. We thank you, Father, for fresh revelation, fresh anointing upon all the members as they cover the earth with the full gospel of Jesus Christ. And Father, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. We thank you for doing it. Amen.